October 1949. Victory celebrations in Beijing. Over 30 years after the Soviet Revolution, communism makes a second great advance. The country with the largest population in the world now has a communist government. Photographer Hu Bo is on the platform. The square was full of excited people chanting, Long live Chairman Mao. But there was really only one thing on my mind. And that was to capture those precious moments with my camera and lead them to future generations. It was a special day for China. After thousands of years of struggle, we were liberated at last. What a joy. The crowds in Tiananmen Square hear Mao Zedong proclaim a new beginning. <laughs> Mao says China will now be free of inequality, poverty and foreign domination. Almost overnight, one-fifth of the world's people become part of the greatest experiment in mass mobilization of the 20th century. They will be told to work, live, and think in a new way. But in a series of cataclysmic social experiments, millions will suffer or die as they attempt the great leap toward Mao's new society. For the first half of the 20th century, most Chinese still lived in ways that had remained unchanged for generations. Four out of five worked on the land in desperate poverty. Most were in debt to landowners or moneylenders. In the west of China, Hu Ben Shu's family were landless laborers. It was a hard life. We had very little to live on. I wove cloth day and night to make ends meet. We could only just scrape by. In the past, there was justice for the rich, but nothing for the poor. Who cared about us then? Nobody. You can't believe how badly the poor were treated. The need to tackle rural poverty and modernize was recognized in the 1920s. President Chiang Kai-shek re-established a central government, ending the turmoil between rival warlords. His nationalist party drew support from Chinese businessmen and the landowners in the countryside. Foreigners were allowed to keep their privileged hold over trade and finance. And the nationalists believed that in time, capitalism would spread its wealth out to the other China, beyond Shanghai and the coastal cities. I time in dear old Shanghai, and I'm dancing sweetheart with you. But the gulf between the lives of the middle class and the masses of peasants and laborers remained as wide as ever. Jing Jing Zhe was married to a leading Shanghai businessman. I learned how to dance and used to go out with my husband to social functions. 
He enjoyed playing mahjong and always took a lot of trouble about how he dressed when he went out. As China began to industrialize, low wages and poor conditions increased the social divide. After the success of the Russian Revolution, some looked to China's newly formed Communist Party for a radical change that could shake China out of its lethargy. Starting in Shanghai, the Communists attempted to stir up the city's factory workers. But they were savagely suppressed by Chiang Kai-shek's forces. Those who survived fled to the countryside and were pursued across China. 80,000 set out on what came to be called the Long March. Fewer than 8,000 survived. From their camp in the caves of Yan'an, their leader Mao Zedong planned a new kind of revolution that would spring from the countryside rather than from the workers in the cities. In a short time, he said, several hundred million peasants will rise like a tornado or a tempest. During the Second World War, the communists and nationalists joined forces to fight the Japanese invaders. But when the war ended, a full-scale civil war between the two sides resumed. Mao promised the peasants land reform, and his troops treated them well. When the soldiers first came to our village, I was really scared of them. I didn't even dare sleep in my room. They told me they were the People's Liberation Army and that I shouldn't be frightened. They slept in the street and were extremely well behaved. By the autumn of 1949, the communists had driven the nationalists out of all the major cities. They fled to the island of Taiwan, taking the country's gold reserves with them. Mao Zedong took over a bankrupt, devastated country and immediately set out to transform it. Mao now held more power than any leader since the emperors. He promised a China that could stand on its own feet alongside the other world powers. Mao's version of communism was to be the foundation for a purer, fairer, more progressive state than the one that had emerged in the Soviet Union. It was to be a revolution in which the peasants were to take the leading role. Activists would explain the ideas of class identity and class struggle to every village and workplace and incite the peasants to speak up against enemies of the people. Chinese were now bombarded with propaganda. Traveling projection teams took films to the remotest areas, bringing the message of active socialism. As the revolutionary program began, the peasants were the first to benefit. They were granted the land reform they'd wanted for so long. It was the party's plan that they should seem to make the change themselves. Speak bitterness meetings were held in which the landlords and others linked to the defeated nationalists were confronted and denounced by the peasants. <laughs> Mm. 
We were told to get together and ask the landlords to return land to us. We stated how much they should return and how they should return it. There was a denunciation meeting every day. Local party secretary Lua Shifa helped whip up feeling in his village. The first thing we had to do was to bring down the landlords. What we did was persuade the tenant farmers to denounce them. At the public meeting, they would explain how they couldn't afford to pay back the rent every year, or how they had to take out high interest loans to pay it off. People around the stage sympathized with the poor peasant stories, and they'd weep. Hundreds of thousands were killed. The class warfare was less vicious in the cities. The communists tried to win the support of the managers and technicians the revolution needed to keep the mills and plants running and to assimilate the capitalist owners who had not left with the nationalists. Propaganda showed businessmen handing the deeds of their companies over to the state and then celebrating with improbable glee the new socialist dawn. Jian Guadong, district party secretary, heard what was really happening. By day, they pretended to support the party. But at night, behind closed doors, they'd gather their families around them and cry, bemoaning the fact that everything they'd worked for would soon be lost. When we realized this, we decided to recruit capitalists who sympathize with the party. The Jing family in Shanghai decided it was best to cooperate. Mrs. Jing took part in a film explaining her new outlook to other wives. After liberation, the communists didn't like businesses like my husband's, so he was in trouble. Then we studied the party's policies and decided that joint ownership with the state was the only solution. But for those who resisted, the changeover could be bloody. Chi Youyi worked at a Beijing factory. The big bosses in our factory were executed immediately. The less important ones were forced to reform through hard labor. We were asked to keep an eye on them. We hated them so much, we beat them if they didn't work hard enough. That's the way they treated us. In the past, they've been the masters. Now, we were. Women were given new rights at work and in marriage. The painful tradition of foot binding was abolished. And women were helped in the drive to end illiteracy. Gao Yu Ying from a village near Beijing was first.
first a pupil and a teacher. Once I'd learned how, I could teach others to read. I didn't have a blackboard, so I used a wooden door. I wrote words on it and May copied them. Some of them had their babies with them, breastfeeding and studying at the same time. I can tell you, it was really hard. To clean up China's dirt and disease, the communists launched mass campaigns and expected everyone to take part. Propaganda films were used to set the pace. Millions were inoculated against the epidemic diseases that had racked China. War was waged on old habits. The pressure was inescapable. Party activists checked up on their neighbors' housework. Zhen Fu Qin from the local street committee went from house to house. We used to say, do you love your country? The country is calling on you to carry out the public health campaign. Get on with it. When they heard this, people said, ah, if we don't do it well, that means we don't love our country. We used to go up the lane to check on people's housework to see if they'd done it properly. We'd examine the tables to see if they were dusty. If everything was neat and tidy, that would be fine. If not, I would tell the women to do it better. We cleaned the alley and put up posters. One said, everyone must help to exterminate the four pests. Nothing escaped attention. One of the official pests was the sparrow. The small birds were accused of devouring the crops. The word came down from above to mobilize the people to kill the sparrows. Villagers of all ages joined in. We were so busy, we even had to take turns to eat. The trees were really high and hard to shake, but everyone did their best so the sparrows couldn't land. We used slingshots. Some people used guns. Whoever killed the most sparrows was praised and given rewards. Those who caught fewer were criticized and encouraged to do better the next day. In fact, the campaign backfired. With the sparrows gone, more insects survived to strip the crops.
The same effort to get mass participation was applied to another type of cleansing, of incorrect thoughts. People were asked to look out for neighbors or fellow workers who seemed to meet the party's description of rightists or capitalists or counter-revolutionaries. They were then denounced. But the boldest attempt to harness the energy and enthusiasm of the people came in 1958. To speed up progress, Mao wanted to use the force he believed in most, China's sheer numbers, for his great leap forward. Propaganda cartoons showed how the Chinese were meant to overtake Western industry and food production. Land so ceremoniously given to the peasants after the revolution was now taken back and the peasants were herded into huge communes. District Secretary Zhen Guadong oversaw the operation in his area. I was responsible for setting up people's communes and turned eight agricultural cooperatives into two big communes. There were over a hundred thousand people in each one. Big communes could handle big projects. With thousands of people to do a job, things were completed in no time. Production brigades were sent where they were thought to be needed most, under military-style discipline. The party said it was a more efficient, better, faster way to build socialism. Private ownership of land had already been eliminated. Now family life was to be destroyed as well. Peasants were to eat food cooked in central kitchens. Children would be looked after together. Mao set the target of doubling food production in one year. Revolutionary enthusiasm, he said, will triumph over all obstacles. He took a close interest as the peasants tried to increase yields. When the Dongsheng commune promised a record harvest, it was Zhen Guadong, the district secretary, who showed the chairman around. Chairman Mao himself visited the show field and asked how much it was expected to yield. My colleague said 50,000 pounds an acre. Chairman Mao replied, even if you could achieve 10% of that, it would be a miracle. Wheat yields had typically been about 500 pounds an acre. Now the party encouraged competition among the communes to push up the yields. Quan 全线各乡打擂台的英雄和干部们一起宣誓争取水道超过万斤 The pledges were absurd, but the communes falsified their records to back them up. We removed the already planted rice from the fields and replanted it in a show field so that we could reach our quota. Planting it so densely with no light or wind blowing through meant it would rot. Before long, the rice did rot, and the peasants got angry. They said, if you take all the rice and waste it, what will we eat in the autumn? The peasants didn't want to go on with this cheating. I tried to get it stopped, but the local boss ordered us to carry on.
But the false statistics contributed to a dangerous delusion that China had plenty of food and could concentrate on other things. We must reach for the moon and the stars, said Mao. Man can achieve anything he can imagine. Huge construction projects also pitted great masses of people against apparently insuperable obstacles. Lin County in Hunan was an arid plain blocked off by mountains. The 1,800-mile-long Red Flag Canal was planned to bring in water over the rocky terrain. The canal workers were celebrated as revolutionary heroes. Chung worked on the rock face. I tie a rope around my body and swing out into the air. I used a pick to remove the loose stones. When they fell, I had to try hard to keep out of the way to avoid getting my legs broken. Accidents were frequent. Zhen Yongcheng was sent to clear up afterwards. When you were at the foot of the mountain and looked up, you could see bits of flesh glinting in the sun. I climbed down the rope. I picked up some dirt to wipe away every trace of the bodies. Otherwise, people would have been too frightened to carry on. But the canal took twice as many people and far longer to build than expected. Initially, there were 30,000 on the project. The plan was that if each person built one meter, the canal would be completed in one or two months. But it was all much more difficult because the canal was halfway up a mountain. In the end, it took 10 years to complete. To meet the most ambitious goal of the Great Leap Forward, Mao told the Chinese that production of steel had to double in one year. And instead of producing this just from heavy industry, the energy and idealism of the peasants was to be mobilized again. Small furnaces were built in villages and backyards across the country. They collected any scrap they could find. They melted down doorknobs, wash basins, tools. As the fever grew, people gave up their cooking walks. Ho Jinghua had never made steel before, but used her ingenuity. When we built our own furnaces, it was hard to reinforce them. Earth on its own wasn't strong, but we didn't have enough straw. I had a long pigtail, so I cut it off and snipped it into short pieces and mixed it with the earth in the furnace wall. Many of the other women cut off their hair as well. Ho Qinghua's husband, Lian Qian Yun, also filmed at the time, was just as enthusiastic. The two of us competed really hard. If my team produced three tons of steel a shift, her team would make over three tons. And then I would encourage my team to think of ways to beat that. Forests were decimated to fuel the furnaces 24 hours a day. All 
all over China, almost everyone, even medical doctors, neglected their normal jobs to answer the call. But even those taking part began to see it was folly. All we did was make steel and nothing else. We didn't produce anything useful. How could we? We dug holes in the ground and tried to produce steel. It was all such a waste of time. But the orders came from above. We had to obey them. Slowly, it became clear that after so much effort and time, after so much wood had been burned, and so many pots and pans consigned to the flames, the steel produced was impure, weak, and useless. The full effect of the disastrous experiment began to be seen in 1959. While the peasants had been making steel, they had done little else. Crops had rotted in the fields. Seed hadn't been planted. Food was already short. Because of the falsely exaggerated harvest, the government had taken a bigger share of the crops to send to the cities. A drought made the problem worse. In 1960, the scarcity turned into a major famine. National food production fell more than 25 percent. Local secretary Luo Shifa had been away from his village studying at a party school. When I came back from Beijing, I saw that many people had bloated stomachs from starvation. We had 1,600 starving people in our commune. Some were falling over with weakness and just lying in the road. Others died. When the peasants saw me, they began to cry. I cried too. They said to me, if I'd gotten there any later, they might all have been dead. In a secret report. The party later admitted the full extent of the calamity. Their own figures showed that over 20 million had died from the famine. It was almost certainly more. The new graves in the burial grounds confirmed that the great leap had failed. Revolutionary enthusiasm hadn't been enough. In the aftermath, Mao kept to the side. And let the president Liu Xiaoqi run the country. Even Mao knew that the economy had to be protected from his revolutionary zeal for the time being, so more cautious targets were set. Large communes were abandoned. Chinese peasants were allowed some land again and could sell their produce in free markets. They were allowed to live as families and return to a more normal life. Revolutionary rhetoric was toned down. There were fewer slogans, but Mao was biding his time. He feared his revolution was losing steam, and he was losing control. He saw a privileged bureaucratic class emerging, as had happened in the Soviet Union. He feared the return of capitalism and materialist incentives, and believed China's chance to have a perfect socialist society was passing. Mao's supporters printed a book of quotations from his political speeches and writings, and used them as the basis for a new attack on what was called the capitalist road. We still have to wage a protracted struggle against bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideology, said Mao. As he tried to regain power, Mao used a piece of spectacular political showmanship to revive his reputation. <laughs> Oh, 
To demonstrate his vigor at the age of 72, he led a mass swim across the river Yangtze. The thousand-year-old Beijing opera was Mao's next target. He wanted to break the thinking and attitudes of old China, and he began with her traditional culture. If the opera could be changed, then anything could be. Eight new revolutionary plays were written to replace the old stories of emperors and concubines. Dong Xiangling, who once played princes, now played an officer in the People's Army. I was chosen to play this revolutionary role, and it was a great honor. As artists, we were engineers of human souls. We didn't just perform to earn money, but had a serious responsibility to re-educate people. We were so happy that Chairman Mao was creatively involved in this opera. In August 1966, Mao unleashed the great proletarian cultural revolution. He was assisted by a group later known as the Gang of Four, which tried to build the Mao cult to new heights. In school, children recited his message to them. In Shanghai, at the number six girls' school, Xiao Ailing was the headmistress. The pupils came to realize that all the changes taking place in their families, at school, in Shanghai, and China were brought about by Chairman Mao. Students were used to carry the Cultural Revolution forward. For the first time, young people were encouraged to attack authority and the old hierarchy of the party. And the advice came from Mao himself. Bombard the headquarters, he said. To rebel is justified. One of the Beijing students who were the first to call themselves Red Guards was Zhong Baojing. Chairman Mao started the Cultural Revolution to keep up the momentum for change. Everything he said was right. We thought if we follow Mao, we can't go wrong. Only he can lead us from one victory to another. A succession of huge rallies was held in Tiananmen Square. The master of mass mobilization had shown he could still draw a political response directly from the people. This time, it wasn't the peasants in the country who did his bidding. The most educated and energetic generation in China was following his every word. The students felt excited and liberated as never before. (laughs) 
An estimated 11 million Red Guards came to see Mao. 15-year-old Zhao Shuyun was presented to him. 那个时候呢，我是只顾的呃激动。I was so overwhelmed by the excitement. My mind just went blank. The only thing I wanted to do was to get a good look at Chairman Mao and shake his hand if I got the chance. I shook hands with him three times because I'd been received by Chairman Mao. Millions of Red Guards regarded me with awe. When they saw me, they always wanted to shake the hand that Chairman Mao had shaken. The rising fervor was directed at Mao's rivals, including President Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. Banners attacked Liu. Even small children were taught to denounce Liu. The rage was extended to foreign governments. Western diplomats in Beijing were attacked. Almost anyone who was in power of any kind was denounced as a capitalist sympathizer. The whole structure of the party was brought down, including Zhen Guodong, the district secretary in Tianjin. In all the previous campaigns, I'd been singling people out and telling them their mistakes. I was the one who found fault with them. I didn't expect the tables to be turned on me this time around. Some of the biggest high school students who were very loyal to Chairman Mao pressed my head down, twisted both my hands behind my back, and made me bend over throughout the denunciation meeting. I didn't think I'd survive. In Sichuan, Luo Shifa, the party secretary who'd helped his village through the famine, was denounced. I didn't expect the Cultural Revolution would affect me. Why should it? I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. I'd always had the support of the people. At the denunciation meeting, they slapped my face and forced me to kneel down. Kneeling on hot charcoal and broken glass was almost a daily routine. So what I did was to put a soft pad inside my pant legs, and that made it easier when I was forced to my knees. In schools, pupils attacked their teachers. Our headmaster had been really good to us, but even he couldn't escape. We didn't hate him personally, but he represented bourgeois values, so we had to attack him. We dragged our headmaster onto the school stage. Then students put a dunce cap on his head and a big placard around his neck. The more extreme we were, the more loyal we felt to Chairman Mao. In Shanghai, the teacher who taught her class to love Mao was now accused of being disloyal. There were several hundred red guards wearing armbands. Others had military belts. Some had scissors in their hands. 
ready to cut people's hair. They chopped off my hair and beat me with sticks. They ordered me to produce the red book and to recite that revolution means rebellion and violence. That day I was wearing a white shirt without pockets, so I wasn't carrying the red book with me. They said, if you're not carrying the red book, that means you aren't loyal to Chairman Mao. How dare you say you love Chairman Mao? You deserve to be overthrown. It was December in Shanghai and very cold. They ordered me to stand outside the playground from morning to night. But then they thought the punishment wasn't severe enough, so they got a big blackboard and pressed it down on me. One of them stood on the right side and one on the left, like a seesaw, and I was squashed in the middle. They wanted to knock me down and keep me down forever. Xiao Ailing was left with permanent injuries to her face. Up to a million were killed or driven to suicide. The country was now in the grip of a revolutionary mania that became more and more violent and destructive. The Red Guards attacked the four olds. Old habits, old ideas, old customs, old culture. Books were burned and museums pillaged. Soon, rival factions of Red Guards fought one another. We used clubs and guns. Many were beaten until they bled. Others died. But we all felt we were the true defenders of Chairman Mao's revolution. To die for the great leader was an honor. The anarchy spread. Schools and hospitals closed. Offices and factories were in chaos. The factory almost came to a standstill. Production was impossible. We had meetings every day and workers were denounced. We didn't know what to do. One day you'd be arrested and the next day it would be my turn. We didn't know what would happen to the country. Many workers committed suicide by jumping in front of trains or into the river. The attempt at a state of continuous revolution was impossible to keep up. Eventually, people craved the return to a more normal, stable life. After two years, the army had to be called in to end the factional fighting, restore order, and help re-establish the party's authority. And the Red Guards were sent to the countryside to cool off and learn from the peasants. But the Cultural Revolution only ended in 1976 with Mao himself. In a bid to keep the country together, the propagandist exploited the scenes of mass emotion on Mao's death.
much of the grief was genuine, and many had seen their lives improve, but millions had suffered or died, victims of Mao's attempt at perpetual revolution. All of his charisma had not delivered the new society he'd promised. After Mao's death, his closest associates, the Gang of Four, were arrested and charged with throwing the country into chaos. His most cherished ideas were abandoned. <laughs> Mao's successor, Dong Xiaoping, tried to replace ideological fervor with economic activity. The Chinese were to be mobilized not by dreams of equality, but by money. In the 1980s, political control was as tight as ever, but the slogan from the top was, to get rich is glorious. But one legacy of Mao's reliance on popular action remained. During the Cultural Revolution, he'd allowed the students to challenge authority and feel a new sense of liberation. After Mao, the state always knew that the people, once they'd learned how, might try to challenge the party's authority again. And their fears were to be borne out in 1989 on Tiananmen Square. <laughs>